Welcome to part one of Against All Opposition, the teaching series. All right. Now, um, if I can just uh, throw this up here, uh, this is Against All Opposition by Greg Bonson. And this is what we're going to be working through. So I'm going to be going through a multi part series, uh, going over the study questions of the end of each of the chapters here. So this is not a. Um, a teaching series that goes comprehensively through every aspect of the book, but I, I'm definitely trying to touch all of the major um, high points. So at the end of each chapter, if I can kind of flip through this bad boy here, um, there are some study questions. Here we go. Boom, boom, boom. You can't really see that, but at the end of the chapter, there's some study questions. And so I want to take the time to kind of go through some of these and kind of expand on them a little bit um, because the study questions kind of capture the essence of each of the chapters. So this is going to be a great opportunity to, uh, if you don't have time to read the book, um, this will be a great opportunity to kind of work through some of the major themes, um, which I think are going to be helpful, not just for um, equipping people to do apologetics in general, um, but to actually get your feet wet into presuppositional apologetics. So, so this series is going to be based upon uh, Greg Bonson's book, Against All Opposition. Now, just a little bit about this book. Um, this is not a book actually written by Greg Bonson, um, who I'll explain who Greg Bonson is. Um, this is actually a series of lectures that he gave that were compiled. So this, they're kind of like a transcript in book form um, of various lectures that Dr. Bonson gave. And this was put out by American Vision. So if, you're, if you want to get a physical copy of this book, it's available there um, at AmericanVision. I think it com or org okay also there are some other books here that i'm thinking if i we'll see how this one goes i want to see if i can do maybe kind of um uh, a multi-part series uh going through the same thing like i'm going with this book through this book here the impossibility of the contrary without god you can't prove anything and again this is in the spirit of this book this book is a transcription of a series of lectures that that dr bonson gave um, and of course, there are some study questions here that highlight the key portions of the chapter. So again, I, I might want to do these books here. Now, there is a third, okay, I feel like I'm holding up a deck of cards, called Pushing the Antithesis. Now, I want to say something about all three of these books. Um, the Impossibility of the Contrary, Pushing the Antithesis, um, these are, you know, antithesis. You don't hear that word often, right? Um, it sounds technical, but actually this book here, okay, um, was written, uh, or I'm sorry, was uh, was a series of lectures that Dr. Bonson gave to high school students who were going off to college. And so this was a series of lectures that he gave to prepare them for that. So while it, the, the language might sound a little technical there, this is all like introductory stuff, perfect for, um, you know, high school students or um, anyone who just wants to begin to start thinking about apologetics and how we should approach uh, the defense of the faith, um, because I want I want to encourage folks that we can be confident in the Christian faith, and there's a difference between how the world perceives the Christian faith and how the Christian faith actually is. So the world can often come across as um, accusing Christians of being irrational or uneducated, uh, when in fact there is a great intellectual tradition that stands behind the Christian faith, and I want folks to become aware of that. Um, I want people to be confident. I want people to be able to articulate the faith, articulately defend the faith, um, and make an impact in where God has placed them. Okay. So to that end, this is part one of the teaching series of Against All Opposition, the study questions. If you enjoy this lecture, please, uh, or this lesson here, uh, please leave comments and interact, uh, encourage one another. Uh, if Christians are kind of interacting in, in the comments there, um, and try to expand on some of the things that I will be discussing in, um, in the following lesson. All right. So this is part one. Uh, again, I'm going to be going through all of the chapters and there are a total of 11 chapters. So this is going to be pretty long. Um, each individual lesson may not be long, but I'm going to hopefully uh, throughout the upcoming months, complete all 11 chapters and put this in a nice playlist for folks on the YouTube channel and Real Apologetics and hopefully that will be useful uh, to people. Um, if you do find this content helpful, um, I would greatly support, uh, I would greatly appreciate your support if possible. Um, on revealedapologetics.com, there is a donate section that definitely helps me um, financially just upkeep the website 
and some of the back end costs that I have to do this uh, this ministry. So if you are um, grateful for the content and that you find it useful, um, any help would be greatly appreciated. All right. Um, but to that end, let's uh, let's begin. I'm going to share some of my slides here. OK, so against all opposition, defending the Christian worldview. All right. Now, um, let's kind of let me here. Let me uh, introduce you to the author of the book here, Against All Opposition. This is Greg Bonson. Now, Greg Bonson was a Reformed minister within the OPC, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church, and, a, and he was a noted apologist of what we call the Vantillian tradition. Okay, Vantillian tradition. This it relates to the Christian philosopher Cornelius Van Til, um, who uh, was one of the founding members of Westminster Theological Seminary. Um, and he, uh, that was the founding of Westminster was kind of spearheaded by another individual that we're going to be talking about later on in this particular lesson. And that is J. Gresham Machen. Uh, J. Gresham Machen, we'll talk a little bit about, but he um, hired Cornelius Van Til to be the professor of apologetics at Westminster Theological Seminary. And um, you're going to find it very interesting to kind of know the context from which that that actually occurred. So we'll we'll get there a little bit later. But Greg Bonson um, was a Christian apologist. He, he passed away in 1995, but he was a debater, an analytic philosopher, um, super smart dude and very down to earth. So a lot of his lectures can be found on Sermon Audio. Uh, they're all available for free there. And there's just hours and hours worth of content if you want to learn from Dr. Bonson himself. So uh, that's Sermon Audio. You type in Bonson Project and all of his lectures will pop up there. And I highly, highly recommend that people check out Dr. Bonson. Okay. So uh, when we speak of someone coming from the um, apologetic tradition known as Vantillianism or um, if we can use the more popular term, presuppositionalism, we're referring to a particular type of apologetic method. So um, I grew up watching uh, martial art movies with my with my dad, and uh, a lot of these movies were really within the context of, of the story were typically schools of kung fu uh, vying for you know greatness. You know what which method or which style of martial arts was the best, and you'd have you know you'd have karate, you have kung fu, you have uh, jujitsu, and these different schools of the presuppositionalism is a school of thought or a methodology within the uh, context of apologetics. So uh, you have different ways of doing apologetics. And so there's the um, you know classical method, which is probably more uh, well known. You have someone like William Lane Craig, who would represent the classical approach. Uh, again, this is not going to be a talk on the different methods, uh, but just to give context, um, there's the classical method, there's the evidential method um, of apologetics, and there are others as well. But presuppositionalism is, I think, a very unique method of apologetics. And um, this is the method that I adhere to for a number of reasons, um, which we'll, we'll talk a little bit about as we move along. So um, this book, Against All Opposition, is a book on presuppositional apologetics. If we can kind of give a, a summary, this is the summary the book itself gives on the back uh, cover, Against All Opposition lays out the definitive apologetic model to help believers understand the biblical method of defending the faith, okay? So um, the uh, Greg Bonson and those who are within the Vantillian tradition, um, and of course, Van Til himself, uh, they were, as I am, convinced that the Bible not only commands us to defend the faith, uh, but it gives us a method. OK, now, again, the Bible is not a handbook. It's not a, a textbook by any means where it lays out all of the details. But I think when we take principles laid out in Scripture um, and when we consistently apply those principles to this realm of engaging unbelievers, what emerges is, I think, a consistently presuppositional approach to defending the faith. And again, we'll define what that means for folks who might not uh, still be unfamiliar. They might be unfamiliar with what this methodology is, is all about. Okay. So against all opposition lays out the definitive apologetic model to help believers understand the biblical method of defending the faith. Okay. So presuppositionalism simply defined, um, and this is my favorite definition, but I'll kind of give a, a couple of, um, definitions here, and hopefully that'll be helpful in, in helping folks folks understand what presuppositional apologetics is. Okay, so I would define 
presuppositional apologetics as a method of defending the Christian faith that seeks to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, even the thoughts of the unbeliever. I'm going to read that again, nice and slowly. This is, I think, the heart of what a presuppositional apologetic approach is getting at. It is a method of defending the Christian faith that seeks to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, even the thoughts of the unbeliever. Okay, this is very important because when we bring every thought captive, when we have thoughts, when we have beliefs, when we have ways of thinking and reasoning, sometimes we engage in those things in a way that does not uh, reflect the lordship of Jesus Christ over our thinking. And so when we, when the Bible speaks of, and this is kind of a reference of, in scripture, when the scripture speaks of bringing every thought captive, this, is, the, this scripture is encouraging us to think like Christians. We want to think like Christians. Jesus Christ is our Lord. He is the Lord over our hearts, as 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, to set apart Christ as Lord in our hearts, uh, which again, and you've heard folks who have followed this channel know that I often make reference to the heart, not so much being the organ in your chest, but being the center of one's being, uh, one's mind, if you will. Uh, Jesus Christ is, Christ is to be the Lord over our minds. And so everything we think must be brought into uh, captive and brought into obedience to Christ, even the thoughts of the unbeliever. So when I'm defending the Christian faith, um, the unbeliever's thoughts and lines of reasoning and arguments are things that are setting themselves up against the lordship of Jesus. And so while I'm defending the faith, I want the unbeliever to recognize that unless he brings every thought captive to the obedience of his maker, he can't make sense out of anything he's doing, right? Um, so, and we'll kind of unpack that a, a little bit as we move along. But um, in essence, I think this biblical passage here, bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ, even the thoughts of the unbeliever, I think captures well what the presuppositional apologetic method seeks to do, right? I want to encourage Christians to think like Christians, and I want to encourage Christians to see the unbeliever as the Bible sees the unbeliever and take all of these things into consideration when we're actually engaging in the apologetic uh, task, okay? Um, again, an, another um, definition of presuppositional apologetics that I like is, is this simple definition here. The uh, presuppositional apologetics is the application of Christian theology to unbelief. Okay, the application of Christian theology to unbelief. Now, Christian theology, uh, for those who are super duper beginners, theology just refers to the study of God. Okay, when we speak of Christian theology, it's the study of the Christian God, right? And of course, we have content about God that's given to us in Scripture, okay? And so when we study theology, um, you can come at theology in, in different ways. Uh, there's the discipline known as biblical theology. Then there's the uh, discipline known as systematic theology, where we seek to take all of what the Bible has to say about any given topic and kind of hold them in a coherent system in which we can understand how our beliefs in one area relate to our beliefs about God in other areas, right? We kind of hold to these beliefs systematically, okay? Now, the application of Christian theology to unbelief. So there is a Christian theology of prayer. What does the Bible tell us about prayer? There is a Christian theology about God himself, right? Who God is. What is the nature of God? What are the attributes of God? When we speak of God's spirituality, his invisibility, when we speak of God's aseity, this idea that he does not depend on anything uh, else um, for his own existence, right? He is self-sufficient unto himself, okay? When we talk about the Trinity, when we talk about God's omniscience, this idea that God knows everything, that God is omnipresent, that he is present everywhere, that God is um, uh, omnipotent. So you have the three, the three omnis, right? The three attributes, the three omni attributes, omnipotence, God's all-powerful, omniscience, God knows all things, and omnipresent, God is everywhere present. Um, the Bible tells us these things. That, that Those are elements of Christian theology, right? Um, but there is also a Christian theology of unbelief. How are we to view the unbeliever and the nature of unbelief itself? Well, the Bible informs us how we should uh, perceive unbelief, 
Okay. Uh, you know, the Bible says in the book of Psalm, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Bible tells us a lot about the nature of unbelieving thought and the wisdom of the world versus the wisdom of God. There is a Christian theology of unbelief. And when we are defending the Christian faith, we want to do so in a way that does not conflict with our biblical theology of unbelief or our biblical theology of the unbeliever. Okay, we want to see the unbeliever and interpret the unbeliever in a way that is consistent with what the Bible teaches about the unbeliever and about unbelief in general. Okay, so the application of Christian theology to unbelief. Okay, so Jude chapter one, verse three, I think is a good, a good passage to use here. Um, Jude says, beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. So this is important here. So he says that I found it necessary. Okay, this kind of teaches us the necessity of apologetics, right? Because he's speaking about contending for the faith. And an interesting thing here within the context of Jude chapter one, he not only is finding it necessary to defend the faith, to contend for the faith, um, but he's also referring specifically to a necessity of defending the faith within the church. So he's not just talking about like defending the faith against like atheists and agnostics and Muslims or whoever, you know, um, there are actually false doctrines uh, seeping into the church itself. And so Jude is saying, hey, I, you know, it's necessary that um, that we contend earnestly for the faith. And notice what he says here. We are contending for the faith once for all delivered. OK, so the the nature of the faith that we are contending for is a faith that has been delivered to the saints. Delivered by who? Well, it was delivered by the apostles. Who, And of course, it has its roots in the teachings of Christ and, of course, the, the, the Old Testament, right? There is a body of Christian truth that we are defending, okay? And this is very important because when we defend that body of Christian truth, that faith once for all delivered, again, the method of defending that body of Christian truth must not be inconsistent with that body of Christian truth, okay? So presuppositionalists uh, really emphasize the importance of consistency. The way we defend the faith must be consistent with our foundation, okay? And that foundation, of course, is God and his word, right? This is something that's hugely foundational for us. It is our ultimate authority, the word of God. The word of God is so authoritative um, that, it holds the very word of God itself. I think it was Wayne Grudem in his systematic theology. I think he he says something along the lines that when we disobey the word of God, we are disobeying or disbelieving God himself because God speaks to us in his word. Uh, when God made a promise to Abraham, it says that he swore by himself because there was no there was no one greater than him, right? You know, when we make promises and swear, it's like, I swear by my mother, or I swear, you know, someone will say, I swear to God, right? Uh, we swear by something greater than ourselves, um, but God does not swear by anything greater than himself because he is the greatest. So he swears by himself. The word of God must be central to our apologetic. It must be the foundation upon which we stand and the soil out of which our apologetic, our defense, flows and grows out of. All right. All right. First Corinthians chapter one, verses 20 through 21. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I like that passage. And I think in, in against all opposition, I mean, Bonson rightly uses uh, this passage to really kind of typify what the presuppositional approach is trying to get at. Okay. I mean, the book's entitled Against All Opposition, Defending the Christian Worldview. Against all opposition. So whatever the opposition is, whether it is an agnostic, whether it's an atheist, whether it's a Muslim, whether it's a Mormon, whether it's a Hindu, whether it's anybody, right? The Christian um, offers the challenge. Where is the wise according to this world? Where is the scribe? Where is the scholar, right? Where is the great debater of this age? And Paul says, has God, has not God made foolish? The wisdom of the world. And this is really important because when we are doing apologetics and we're studying theology and philosophy, it's very easy that we become enamored with the wisdom of this age, right? We become, we stand in awe of the great philosophers of our contemporary world and the scientists and the, you know, the great thinkers in our modern context. 
But and again, I'm not disparaging the great accomplishments that you know intellectual accomplishments that people have achieved. Uh, but ultimately, at the foundation, the Bible calls foolishness the wisdom of this world. What what is the wisdom of this world? It's a wisdom that's not grounded in Christ. It's a wisdom that is defined not by the standards of the origin of wisdom, but by some other standard. So Paul says, where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? I hope you're getting the theme here. As Christian defenders, we are not defending the Christian faith with a pitiful timidity, but rather a confidence in the surety and truth of God's word. Okay. Um, and this is the spirit with which we are to engage in apologetics. Now, again, we don't do this pridefully, right? We don't want to do this in a way that is dishonoring to God and, and is inappropriately confident in the sense that we are just, you know, trying to refute for the sake of, of showing how smart we are, things like that. That's definitely not what we're trying to do. But there definitely needs to be a confidence because we're standing on the very wisdom of God, right? Okay, so very important. I really like 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20 through 21. That'd be a good memory verse for folks to uh, to, to remind themselves of, of the foolishness of the wisdom of this world uh, as opposed to the wisdom of, of Christ grounded in Scripture. All right, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 5 through 6. Again, shows kind of the aggressive and offensive. I don't mean offensive like I'm offended, like offensive, like defense and offense. Uh, it highlights the offensive nature of the task of engaging unbelievers, right? 1 Corinthians 10, 5 through 6 says, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion, not some lofty opinion, every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. We destroy arguments, okay? People will say, hey, you know, uh, I don't think we should be arguing as Christians. We should just share the gospel. Well, yes, we should share the gospel. And yes, we shouldn't be argumentative, but the Bible says we are to destroy arguments. So there is an appropriate context to engage in argument, giving arguments, and um, refuting arguments, or as the Bible uses here, destroying arguments. And every lofty thing, every lofty opinion that's raised up against the knowledge of God. Okay. Now again, notice the, the knowledge of God, which is actually given to us also in the word of God. There's a there's a con, there's a sense of confidence in these words, not the timidity that we often hear um, in in various contexts where you know well maybe maybe the Bible you know is most likely true or the Bible's very reasonable. We kind of just we're overly apologetic about the Bible as though it's something to be ashamed of, and and it it isn't. The Bible is the very wisdom of God given to us in written form that we're to stand upon those principles and engage the world of unbelief. With, of course, as 1 Peter 3.15 tells us, with gentleness and respect. Okay? There's another important passage. I don't, I don't have it on the screen here, but I want to read it. And it kind of gives us uh, the context for the spirit with which we are to engage in uh, defending the faith. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24 through uh, 20. Let's go through 26. Okay? 2 Timothy 24 through 26 says, And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. Check that out. The Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, okay? I have nothing against arguing, but we need to avoid quarrelsome, a quarrelsome spirit, an argumentative spirit, right? A contentious spirit. We are to avoid that, trying our best to be kind to everyone, able to teach we are able to teach those patiently enduring evil when it when we receive it right correcting his opponents with gentleness okay and we do this to the end that hopefully god grants repentance leading to a knowledge of the truth and then we come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will all right so again very great passages to kind of create a context for how we properly are to engage in the task of apologetics all right. Let's continue on. All right. So chapter one, we kind of get to the book proper here in Against All Opposition. 
The first chapter is entitled Faith and Reason. Uh, again, a very important topic and a topic with history, right? Um, how should we understand the relationship between faith uh, and reason? Okay, and if you want to get the details, I would encourage you to read the book as this is going to be looking through some of the chapter study questions, okay? But we, it is important that we kind of grasp how we should properly understand faith and reason. We often hear kind of this dichotomy set up, right? They're, they're often set side by side. You have faith on the one hand, and then you have this thing called reason on the other. And like the religious people are, are over there and the intellectual, you know, agnostic or atheist or the unbeliever, they're over there, right? We, we just want to use reason. You religious people, you just have faith. Of course, um, I would reject that dichotomy as well. You should as well. Um, they are not incompatible with each other. And, and as we'll see, I would argue that faith is actually the foundation uh, for reason. Um, and so, uh, and, and again, faith properly understood. Okay, faith is not believing something with no evidence or it's not believing something you know ain't true, right? Uh, faith is a trust in a reliable source of the biblical the biblical context there to trust in God himself who has exhibited his faithfulness throughout scripture. This is why it's so important uh, that we read the word of God because in the word of God, we are reminded of the faithfulness of God as he proves himself faithful uh, in his relationship with his people Israel, even in the midst of unfaithfulness to him. So uh, again, we have warrant for trusting God, okay? And we have warrant for trusting our reason because our reason is grounded and given a context and given the meaning that it has within the context of the God who is faithful and has given us these intellectual tools to think rationally and critically, all right? So here are the study questions that we're going to be plowing through. Uh, there are seven in total at the end of chapter one. Number one, what separates the believer from the unbeliever? Is it faith? Okay. Uh, number two, to have faith often means what to unbelievers? Now, how does the unbeliever understand this thing that we call faith? Number three, when unbelievers charge that Christianity is irrational, what do they mean? Number four, in what way are Christian dogmas logically consistent? Number five, explain what J. Gresham Machen means when he states that the Christian faith is a thoroughly reasonable thing. And we'll, uh, again, I'll introduce you to Jay Gresham Machen in just uh, in, in a moment. Well, maybe in a little while, somewhere down the line, uh, we'll eventually get to him, okay? Uh, number six, does neo-orthodoxy teach that Jesus is God? Again, I'll explain what neo-orthodoxy is and we'll answer that question and why it's important. And number seven, what did the apostle Paul mean when he wrote that if you don't have faith, there's no place for reason. Now, of course, uh, those of you who know your scripture, Paul didn't actually say that in those words, um, but I would argue that it is an implication of some of the other things that he says. So we'll talk about that as well. All right. So these are the questions. I want to tackle these one by one, and hopefully this will be helpful for folks who are following along. All right. And just pardon me as I stop every now and then for my cup of coffee. All right. So number one, what separates the believer and the unbeliever? Is it faith? Okay. This is a very important question. As I said before, chapter one of the book, Against All Opposition by Greg Bonson, uh, is a book about presuppositional apologetics. Now, presuppositional apologetics is a worldview apologetic. It focuses on one's worldviews, not so much the details of the facts and the evidence. We definitely talk about that. But the issue is, what worldview is one viewing the facts and interpreting the facts through? I think it's a very important question, okay? What separates the believer and the unbeliever is not that the unbeliever is using reason and the Christian is using faith, okay? What separates the believer and unbeliever is that the believer and unbeliever have different worldviews. We have different intellectual spectacles, if you will, through which we are looking at the world and interpreting the world. This is so vitally important to understand. When we are talking with the unbeliever, we must be sensitive to the fact that we and the unbeliever have differing worldviews. We have a Christian worldview. They have a non-Christian worldview. When we talk about the facts and the evidence, the way we interpret the facts and the evidence are going to be affected by our worldviews, our intellectual lens, okay? 
And so uh, this is kind of step one, right? If, in order to be an effective apologist, uh, you don't want to just run headlong into a, you know, a fact debate. You know, well, I have more facts than you. I have more evidence. That's an important conversation. But it cannot be had in a meaningful way, independent of acknowledging that the reason why we have a, a, a disagreement is because we have different worldview perspectives. As uh, is pointed out in the book, uh, Greg Bonson says, what separates you are the underlying worldviews. It's the philosophy, not the facts. What separates the believer and the unbeliever are not the facts, but the philosophy of facts. Okay, that's what separates the believer and the unbeliever. And then we need to ask the question, who has the proper philosophy of facts? Who has the right glasses through which the facts are being interpreted? That's a very important question. Okay, so... Hopefully that makes sense there. That's the answer to the first question there. That's really a key thing that separates the believer and the unbeliever. Number two, to have faith often means what to unbelievers? Okay, so when we speak to an unbeliever and say, I have faith that the Bible is true. I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. How does the world interpret that? Okay, this is very important because we don't want the world to... Uh, take the word faith, interpret it in accordance, as, in accordance to how they understand it, and then allow the unbeliever's definition of faith to be foisted upon us, okay? Faith has been defined in a number of ways. You can make an entire lecture series, you know, a week long, going through all the different ways that the idea of faith or what it means to have faith has been misrepresented by critics of Christianity. OK, um, what does this mean? Well, within the context of against all opposition, Bonson points out unbelievers think and this is generally speaking, obviously, you have more informed unbelievers who may have a more accurate way of understanding what faith is and what it means to have faith. Um, but Bonson points out here, unbelievers think that to have faith means to let your emotions run wild and turn off your brains. OK, so in essence, according to many unbelievers, faith is anti-intellectual, right? To have faith is not an intellectual thing. It's not something based on reason. Uh, it's just this irrational, you know, conviction that, you know, what I believe is, is true. Okay. And of course, that's not how we understand faith. Okay. Now, this is very important. When we talk about faith, the Bible doesn't, it rarely speaks about faith in, in the sense that like, I have faith that God exists, right? As I mentioned before, the Bible says in the book of Psalms, the fool says in his heart, there is no God. The Bible itself doesn't argue for the existence of God. It just kind of presupposes it, right? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Um, and it says it's foolish to ignore uh, this God who exists, right? So faith in the Bible is typically a trust, right? Usually within the context of a relational trust, it's not a blind leap. It is a trust in a reliable source, okay? God is a reliable object of our faith, okay? And that is not, that does not remove, um, uh, you know, this aspect of, of the intellect, right? We do not stop thinking. We don't turn off our brains when we say, I have faith in God. I have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's just to say that what Christians mean by faith is not this sense of like irrational belief. We believe that faith is very rational. We believe that faith is very reasonable, contrary to uh, popular opinion. All right. Number three, when unbelievers char charge that Christianity is irrational, what do they mean? Okay. Now, again, the answer to this question can vary, right? There, you know, people can mean all sorts of things when they charge Christianity with being irrational. Okay. Um, but Bonson points out in his book, Christianity is often understood as being illogical. So when we say that Christianity is irrational, what often people mean is that Christianity is illogical. And this is to say that something within Christianity is contrary to the canons of logical and rational thinking. People who take this line will often try to demonstrate that certain beliefs within the Christian faith are logically contradictory. OK, they cannot be consistently held. Right. So belief A over here that the Christian has and belief B over here that the Christian have have they're logically in conflict with one another. 
So when someone says Christianity is irrational, they can mean, depending on who you're speaking with, they can mean that Christianity is illogical. All right. And so I think it's important to ask when someone says Christianity is irrational, it's very important to ask, well, what do you mean by that? OK. Uh, and if they take this line, uh, then, of course, allow the person to kind of um, unpack what they mean by that. If Christianity is illogical, that's a good question to ask. What what brought you to that conclusion? You know, why do you think Christianity is illogical? You know, and allow them to bring up the examples. And of course, as Christians, always ready to be uh, always ready to give an answer. We want to be able to address those objections when they come. All right. So some people, uh, when they say Christianity is irrational, what they mean by that is Christianity is illogical. All right. Another way that uh, people who say that Christianity is irrational, they, they often will mean that Christianity lacks evidence, right? So if I say Christianity is irrational, I can mean it's illogical. Or in some contexts, people will, will take that to mean that Christianity lacks any evidence for it, okay? Now, of course, we need to define what constitutes evidence, right? Uh, when uh, skeptics say, oh, there's no evidence for God, uh, what they typically mean, uh, in well, at least in my experience, there is no empirical evidence for God, right? Uh, so people who who are very scientific minded are, are sometimes under the impression, well, unless you can you can prove something scientifically, you don't really don't have evidence for it, and that's just wrong headed. You'll often hear people say something along the lines, well, you know, uh, you know, give me scientific proof of your God, right? You know, and and it's really important to point out, you know, how irrational that is, right? Um, scientific proof. Science is a method of investigating the physical world. And God within Christian theism is a spiritual being. So what you're asking is give me empirical, physical proof and evidence for this immaterial being. Okay. Now I think there is evidence for God. And I think there's a very powerful way in which the very method of science points to God, but just on a surface level, when someone says, give me scientific proof or empirical proof of your God, I don't think the person knows what they're asking. I, I would actually argue that they're making what's called in logic a category error, okay? Uh, so for example, that's like me saying, you know, um, that it's possible to um, detect rubber buried in the sand using a metal detector. Well, of course, it'd be weird to expect that I'm going to detect uh, rubber while using a metal detector. Metal detectors don't detect rubber. They detect metal. In like fashion, to demand scientific proof and specifically empirical evidence for an immaterial being is to make a category mistake. Okay. Now, that's not to say that there's no evidence for God. That's not to say that science cannot be used within or apologetic uh, to point to God. All I'm saying is when someone says Christianity lacks evidence, we want to make sure we want to see what do they mean by that? And are they using appropriate definitions and standards of evidence? Um, and I think that will go a long way in helping us kind of move to the next step of the discussion. Once those those categories are properly defined, then we can kind of lay out some evidence when appropriately um, you know, defined and understood. OK, also uh, evidence is, is again, is going to be interpreted. Right. So um, if if we are saying I need this kind of evidence for your God, but the way that evidence is understood, OK, is within the context of a worldview lens that we reject. Obviously, we're going to disagree as to what constitutes evidence for the truth of something. So, again, this worldview issue is going to be very important. OK, but those are the two ways that people, uh, when they say Christianity is irrational, they typically mean it's illogical. There's a violation of some, you know, logical law and it lacks evidence. But of course, um, we believe everything's evidence for God. Now, we don't think it lacks evidence, but we want to define what evidence is and make sure we proceed accordingly. All right. So defining terms, very, very important. All right. Number four, in what way are Christian dogmas logically consistent? OK, um, so we would affirm as Christians who hold to a Christian worldview that the the dogmas of the Christian faith, the teachings of the Christian faith, they are consistent with each other. The doctrine of the Trinity is logically consistent with the doctrine of um, or the teaching that Jesus is God in human flesh. Right. Uh, they might be difficult to wrap our heads around completely, but we don't think they're illogical. Right. What we believe here within the Christian faith is consistent with what we believe over here. 
And most importantly, our various dogmas, okay, are logically consistent with our operating assumptions. So our presuppositions, our elementary assumptions, our trust in our ultimate authority, our beliefs are going to be consistent with that foundation, okay? As everything that we believe should be consistent with our operating assumptions. Now, that doesn't mean we can, we'll we're gonna know everything, right? We don't have knowledge of every single fact, but the things that we assert with respect to Christian teaching, it should be consistent with our operating assumptions, okay? And of course, to turn it around, what we wanna point out uh, in the unbeliever is that their dogmas, right? are not inconsistent with their operating assumptions, or if they are consistent with the unbelievers' operating assumptions, then their own position is undermined. We'll kind of go into that a little bit later, maybe in a different lesson, but that's an important thing to keep in mind. So yes, we want to affirm as Christians that our um, theology is consistent with our operating assumptions. What we believe is consistent with our presuppositions, okay? And that's just to be consistent. That's not as an, a, an essential feature of, you know, this particular method of, of Christian apologetics, it it's something we all, we want to hold everyone accountable to, right? What you say up here should be consistent with what you believe down here. And if there's an inconsistency, then there's a problem. And within the apologetic encounter, that problem should be brought out. Okay. All right. Number five, explain what J. Gresham Machen means when he states that the Christian faith is a thoroughly reasonable thing. Okay, so real quick. So Jay Gresham Machen is a super cool guy. Now, if you like to read books and you want to read something really good, uh, Jay Gresham Machen, one of the founders of Westminster Theological Seminary, wrote a classic book um, that is entitled Christianity and Liberalism. Okay, now liberalism was a movement that really was challenging Orthodox Christianity. Uh, and it was moving away from, you know, these core essential features of the Christian faith. People who were within this liberal movement in theology denied things like the inerrancy of Scripture or the um, the virgin birth of Christ uh, or things like this. And um, these were seeping into the seminaries. And J. Gresham Machen wrote this masterful book responding to this liberal movement, not to be confused with like liberalism, like in the political sphere, right? This is like liberal theology. So this is his classic book. J. Gresham Machen was kind of the leading defenders of Christian orthodoxy against this rising uh, false theology, okay? Um, and so you definitely want to check out who J. Gresham Machen is, Christianity and liberalism, while he's addressing something that was more prevalent in the earlier 1900s. Um, it definitely has application today, right? Um, because there are a lot of, there are all sorts of things seeping into the church. And we want to be able to distinguish between biblical Christianity and um, counterfeit Christianities, right? Um, as the great uh, late Walter Martin, the father of cult apologetics, once said, that we must um, be familiar with the truth so much so that we are able to identify counterfeits, okay? And he, he often speaks of, uh, you know, uh, studying the counterfeit money when when we uh, when people are trained to identify false money, they don't go around you know studying all of the different varieties of false money. What they do is they become so familiar with the 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 original article, the real deal, the real bill that when they see the counterfeit, they're able to uh, recognize it. So we familiarize ourselves with truth so much so that when error creeps in, we recognize it. I think that's uh, the context here is appropriate here. Uh, given what J. Gresham Machen was doing back then, and given what is required of us today in um, recognizing error when it when it comes. All right, so J. Gresham Machen, awesome dude, founder of Westminster Theological Seminary and author of Christianity and Liberalism, highly, highly recommend. So at any rate, to answer our question, uh, J. Gresham Machen rejected the false dichotomy between faith and reason, okay? Uh, so some people would speak of faith as kind of this irrationality over here, and the, the, the realm of the intellect over here, uh, J. Gresham Machen said, no, that's a false that's a false dichotomy, right? He believed that Christianity was true and in accord with the facts when rightly interpreted, okay? That's a key point there, okay? So let's say, for example, the so science, you know, if science, uh, if, if mainstream science came to various conclusions that seem to be in conflict with Christian theism, um, 
we would say that Christian theism is true. And um, even though things might seem to be in conflict, when all the information is in and the data is rightly interpreted, there, there will be no inconsistency with, um, with Christian faith, with the Christian faith, right? So he believed that Christianity is true and in accord with the facts, all right? So this is not, um, you know, putting Christianity in this irrational category over here and everything else in this intellectual and rationally respectable category over here. No, for J. Gresham Machen, these were closely linked together. Faith and reason are not at odds with one another. They are, um, they are together, all right, in a very important sense, all right? Okay. Number six, uh, does neo-orthodoxy teach that Jesus is God? Now, when I was reading the chapter one in Against All Opposition, um, this question kind of came out of left field. Um, I was, really wasn't sure how to answer it because I, it's been so long since I've studied neo-orthodoxy, okay? Um, and again, while neo-orthodoxy is not something that mainstream Christians are, are going to have to be familiar, familiar uh, with, I mean, if a teenager is watching this and you're trying to equip yourself and you want to walk through this series and say, hey, I want to know how to defend the faith, you might not ever confront neo-orthodoxy. Um, it's an old theology. I, I'm not even aware of people still. I, mean, I suppose there are people who still hold to neo-orthodoxy. But, um, but be that as it may, although this is kind of a, an outdated uh, theology, I think the application uh, is still very relevant uh, to us today. Okay. So just real quick. So Neo-Orthodoxy was a movement within Protestant Christianity that acted as a response to the liberalism that was seeping into the church during the early part of the 20th century. It was seen as a return to a more conservative form of orthodoxy in light of the liberal rejection of key Christian doctrines. So I made, I made mention of liberalism, uh, this theology that came in, uh, you know, took over various schools. I mean, Princeton... Uh, Princeton is, you know, prestigious Princeton um, was overcome by liberal theology. And that's why you had J. Gresham Machen start Westminster Theological Seminary out in um, in Philadelphia. All right. It was to move away from this theology that denied the virgin birth, that denied the inerrancy of scripture, that denied key features of Christian belief. And so a response to that liberalism, you had folks like J. Gresham Machen who wanted to fight for orthodoxy. And then you had kind of a more extreme swing in the other direction. And, that, and that's neo-orthodoxy. So on the surface, neo-orthodoxy seemed to be a strong, um, uh, how can I explain this? Neo-orthodoxy seemed to be in strong opposition to the liberalism. So people who were like, man, liberalism is really dropping the ball on some key issues. Look at these neo-orthodox guys. They, they seem to be getting on the right track. Okay. So I would say that liberalism over here is on the one extreme. And neo-orthodoxy is on the other extreme. There were some good things, but there were some things that I think we need to be very cautious of. Uh, the, trick, the tricky thing about liberalism and neo-orthodoxy is that the way they laid out their theology, it would sound very similar to traditional orthodox conservative Christianity that we would say is right within the realm of appropriate um, orthodoxy. Okay, But the language sounded, you know, we use words, but we don't always mean uh, what we think they mean by those words. It kind of reminds me uh, when you're talking to a Mormon, for example, and, and they'll affirm that they believe in the Trinity. Okay. So they're speaking the same language as us, but in reality, what they believe about the Trinity is that's three separate gods. The father is one God, the son is another God, and the spirit is another God. Well, clearly we don't want to affirm that. That's polytheism or tritheism in that, in that sense. But um, liberal theology and neo-orthodoxy use very Christian language. They were on the opposite side of the spectrum, but I think both of them were kind of veering off to the extreme ends that I think um, we need to be very cautious of. And to that end, I think it's very appropriate to bring this up, even though the average believer is not going to confront uh, neo-orthodox theology very much. Okay, We always want to ask for the definition of terms. And of course, with having a firm grounding in biblical um, orthodox theology, we will be able to engage in misrepresentations when they appear. OK, so uh, these are two key uh, proponents of ne the neo-orthodox uh, tradition. On the right, we have Karl Barth and on the left, we have Emil Bruner. OK, these are two kind of the quintessential uh, neo-orthodox theologian. And again, their literature written, a lot of a lot of information out there on them. But of course, I don't want to get off topic here into uh, the details of that. I just want you to know that 
um, in a general sense, neo-orthodoxy moved in the correct direction away from liberal theology, but fell into some, uh, I think, egregious errors in other areas that we want to be um, cautious of. Okay, So with respect to the deity of Jesus, the fact that Jesus is God, to my knowledge, okay, I would imagine that within neo-orthodoxy, there's a wide spectrum of beliefs, but to my knowledge, the, the, the belief that Jesus is God was affirmed. But again, we want to ask, well, what is, what is meant by that? Okay, it's very important. Um, the neo-orthodox also believed, uh, you know, some of the key pro proponents believe this about the Bible. The Bible is a collection of merely man-made documents, which God uses to create an encounter with the people reading it. Therefore, the Bible becomes the word of God as we read it and encounter God through it. And again, I don't think we want to affirm the idea that the Bible becomes the word of God as we read it. We would argue that the Bible is objectively, independent of our reading it or not, is the word of God as 2 Timothy 3.16 tells us it is theonostos, it is God breathed. Okay, and that's true independent of whether we read it or not. Okay, it is true that we encounter God in the scriptures, but our encountering God in the scriptures does not make the scriptures the scriptures inspired, right? So um, there are a couple of things within neo-orthodoxy that we want to be cautious of. Um, but of course, since you're probably not going to meet a proponent of neo-orthodoxy, the general principle is still the same. We want to be very cautious of any view that uses Christian language, but the definitions that stand behind that language are not matching up with what the Bible actually teaches. And so that's very important. We want to be familiar with what the Bible teaches so that we're in a better position to identify error. All right, let's continue. Number seven, and this is our last question here. What did the Apostle Paul mean when he wrote that if you don't have faith, there's no place for reason? Okay, I would say that Paul teaches that reason and wisdom are rooted in faith. Okay, as the proverb says, the beginning of knowledge, the beginning of wisdom is the fear of the Lord. OK, a proper place of reason is as a tool that is rooted in faith and trust in the source of reason, which is God himself. OK, so a couple of things here in uh, uh, Bonson points out in his book um, Against All Opposition, page 16. Uh, he says this. And this is important because when when you read about presuppositional apologetics and presuppositional methodology, you'll often hear. Ah, you know, presuppositionalists, they don't they don't talk about the evidence. They're not really giving any arguments. They're just asserting that Christianity is true and you have to presuppose that. Uh, and if you don't, you're a fool. That, that's not at all the case, right? Bonson points out, um, rightfully, he says, it was to vindicate the truth of his religious claims that Moses challenged the magicians of Pharaoh's court in Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 13. Okay, so, and this is Bonson speaking, you know, the quintessential presuppositionalist. What we're trying to do with the unbeliever is to vindicate the truth of the Christian faith. We want to argue for the truth of the Christian faith. We could do that in a number of ways. Okay, Bonson continues it was to vindicate the truth of his religious convictions that Elijah competed with and taunted the priests of Baal on Mount Carmel, as recorded in 1 Kings chapter 18, verses 16 through 45. OK, as Van Til himself defines apologetics, uh, Van Cornelius Van Til defined apologetics as the vindication of the Christian worldview over against the non-Christian worldview. So what we're doing when we're doing apologetics is we're seeking to vindicate the Christian worldview. OK, uh, Bonson goes on to say that the resurrection, which is the key feature of the New Testament, right, uh, the Bible says, if Christ has not been raised, you know, we're wasting our time, right? Uh, the resurrection was a mighty sign and wonder that provided evidence for the veracity of his claims and for the apostolic message based upon his claims, okay? So when we're talking about Christian apologetics, Christian defense, and presuppositionalism, I want to overemphasize, we must argue for the truth of our position. We must employ evidence to support our claims, right? We're not against that. Presuppositionalists are not allergic to using evidence. Uh, we just would argue that evidence must be presented in the proper context and in a way that does not, uh, that is not inconsistent with our 
operating assumptions, right? Okay, so the resurrection was a mighty sign and wonder that provided evidence for the veracity of his claims and for the apostolic message based upon his claims. Okay, and so Paul sets up this dichotomy in his letters between godly wisdom and human wisdom. Okay, reason, humanly understood, does not stand as Lord over the wisdom of God. Now, the wisdom of God is given to us in his word and the authority of God's word is what grounds, should ground, proper wisdom. It's godly wisdom that we stand upon. Jesus says that we must build our house upon the rock, as opposed to building our house upon the sand. Human wisdom. What is human wisdom? According to Paul, where he speaks of uh, being cautious of a philosophy, he says we must be cautious of a philosophy that is not rooted in Christ because that kind of philosophy is not true wisdom, right? An uh, a philosophy that is based upon the elementary principles of the world, that is not true wisdom. The world might see that as wisdom. The world might see these great philosophers today and the scientists as standing upon wisdom, but the Bible says it is the wisdom of the world that is based upon elementary principles that are not grounded in Christ. Where is our wisdom? It is grounded in Christ and upon the word of God. Okay. So um, if we go back to our question here, what did the apostle Paul mean when he wrote along the lines of, if you don't have faith, there's no place for reason. He's basically arguing that unless we start with a trust and firm reliance upon God and his word, you don't have reason. Reason is, is, is foolishness, if not rooted upon the wisdom of God. You see, reason doesn't exist in, as this kind of thing independent of everything else. Reason must be understood within a context. It must be understood upon standing upon a foundation. What foundation is our reasoning standing upon? Is it based, pardon, is it based upon elementary principles of this world, which the Bible calls foolishness, or is it based upon or built upon the rock, which is Christ himself, the word of God, okay? So again, hopefully these questions will create the context, okay, let me just remove this here, for the rest of what we're going to be moving through. When we do apologetics, we need to really ask ourselves, what are we standing on? Are we standing on the shaky ground of unbelieving principles and throwing Christian language on top of that so that we can... Uh, communicate better with, uh, you know, the skeptics and things like this? Or are we standing upon the wisdom of God's word, regardless of what the word says, holding uh, fast to the conviction that the word of God is true and that we are in a position to argue for its truth with force, with gentleness and respect, being in a position to destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised up against the knowledge of God. That is the important issue that I think helps us create the context for the rest of the apologetic task, okay? Well, we are just under an hour, and hopefully the rest of our uh, classes, so to speak, will be around there so you get a decent amount of time. I don't want to go too over. Uh, but again, against all opposition, defending the Christian worldview. Until next time, uh, stay tuned for part two in our, uh, I think it's going to be 11-part series. So hope you've enjoyed. I hope you found this helpful and beneficial. And if you like uh, the content here, share it, uh, use what's being spoken of here, uh, taking notes. You can teach it within your own context, in your own church. Hopefully it's beneficial uh, to you uh, to that end. All right. Well, that concludes this class session. Until next time, take care and God bless. Bye-bye.